Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Nate Hurl and I'm the Senior Director for Continuous Improvement at the Cleveland Clinic. We know many of you are calling in from around the country and we hope that you and your families are staying well. We appreciate you joining us today for our weekly COVID-19 webinar series. Caring for our community is one of Cleveland Clinic's four care priorities and our CEO, Dr. Tommy Holovich, and the rest of the team is committed to support you, your people, and your communities in this effort. I've had the rewarding opportunity to work with many local and national businesses to support their safe return to business efforts. And also as a father and youth sports coach and as a sports fan, I'm especially pleased to be a part of today's panel discussion on safely returning to both youth sports and activities. We've been fielding a lot of questions from our community about this topic, but first I wanna share a few updates on free Cleveland Clinic resources and tools to help you to continue to get back to work safely. You can visit our COVID-19 website for employers for the latest updates, including downloadable tools and checklists. We have published a number of industry specific guides to support your COVID response, which are available as free downloads. The website link is on your screen. And for those that are on the phone only, you can point your web browser to clevelandclinic.org slash COVID-19 at work. You can also sign up there to keep updated on the latest COVID-19 news from Cleveland Clinic. We've received a lot of questions in advance. We're gonna do our best to get through the most important issues and we'll address these questions and update our frequently asked questions. If there's something we missed, please contact us and we'll get an answer and we'll post it. We'll also accept questions through the Zoom question and answer feature. You can click on the Q&A button in the webinar controls, type your question and click send. So first I'd like to introduce our three guests for today. First, Dr. Kim Giuliano is the interim chair of primary care pediatrics. She is a Cleveland native and has enjoyed providing primary care to pediatric patients on Cleveland Clinic's main campus for 14 years. Dr. Giuliano has worked with the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as other professional societies to improve the quality of care provided to children with focus on safety, mental health, and preventative health care. As a primary care pediatrician, helping families make healthy and safe choices to promote physical and mental health is an important part of her daily work. Additionally, we have Dr. Dr. Richard Figler. Dr. Figler was born and raised in Northeast Ohio and after residency and fellowship in North Carolina has been with Cleveland Clinic since 2006. He is the interim director of primary care sports medicine for Cleveland Clinic, the director of Pro Cleveland Clinic's primary care sports medicine fellowship and the director of the Concussion Center. He serves as the primary care team physician for Solon High School, John Carroll University, and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Dr. Figler is board certified in family medicine with a certificate of added qualification in sports medicine. Dr. Figler's specialty interests are acute and chronic sports related injuries, pediatric and adolescent sports related injuries, and medical problems in athletes. Finally, Dr. Marie Schaefer, is a Cleveland Clinic staff physician with appointments in both the Orthopedic and Rheumatological Institute and Medicine Institute. And my notes cut off. <laughs> so here we go. She is board certified in family medicine with a special certification in primary care sports medicine. She works primarily in the Center for Sports Health and serves as the head team physician an NCAA healthcare administrator for Cleveland State University. She is also the team physician of Lakewood High School and the Verb Ballet Company. So thank you to the three of us, three of you for joining us today. We have a number of questions we're gonna work through and today we're gonna to first start with some very broad questions and we'll get more specific as we work through the next hour. So first, as we think about our youth returning to sports and activities, many parents, coaches and instructors ask, is the risk worth the reward? Let's first spend a few minutes talking about the reward of participation for our youth. So participation in sports and extracurricular activities definitely has significant impact on a child's physical health. Um, we know that they're using their muscles, their bones, and their bodies to do this work. Um, it's great for their heart, it's great for their lungs, overall wonderful for the physical well-being. I think the other important part to think about is their mental well-being. Um, spending time at home over the last several months, um, isolated from their peers, 
can have it's been a challenging time for a lot of children and having some resemblance of normalcy and getting back to the world that they used to know um, can in and of itself be very beneficial uh, to a child. We also know that when they are exercising, it increases their endorphins or their feel good hormones in the body, and that can contribute to lower levels of depression and anxiety. Um, the other thing to think about is that sports is for some children is a significant outlet from challenging situations otherwise. Um, they may be in a challenging home environment. They may have other challenging situations with their peers and sports gives them the ability to escape from those challenges and um, develop some self-esteem. Uh, especially a child who may have some challenges in the classroom academically. Uh, sports can be a real motivator uh, to help them keep their grades up um, and stay sports eligible. So there's lots of benefits in terms of um, helping them physically as well as mentally. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Giuliano. Dr. Schaefer, could you speak to the risk of participation? How would you describe this in this time of COVID-19? Absolutely. So. There is um, inherently um, a higher risk of, of catching COVID-19 anytime you're out and about in public and interacting with other individuals. And when we are talking about the return to sport um, after this long period of um, isolation, um, we, we're weighing those risks and benefits. And um, anytime you're around um, droplets or the ability to where you're around close contact with those um, type of, of the vi where the virus can um, live, you are more likely to get this. So we think about sports kind of in high risk and low risk categories. So certainly sports like golf or tennis, where you're, you're you know, able to maintain that six feet of social distance um, is going to be safer and less likely to contract the virus versus sports such as uh, soccer, basketball, wrestling, where you're higher risk, where you're coming in closer contact with those droplets. So um, we, as we're thinking about ways to get athletes back into sports, we're also thinking about um, how do we acclimate some of our higher risk sports um, more slowly and carefully to keep those precautions higher versus a sport like golf, we really could get those athletes back on the, um, on the green much quicker. Uh, Dr. Figler, if you could expand on that in terms of the, the risks are associated with different types of activities, what are some of the characteristics that will make certain activities lower risk and other activities higher risk? So, so it's, it's a great question and, and, and I couldn't agree with my colleagues more about you know, the, the potential risk that's out there. Um, you know, our, our goal is to minimize the risk as much as possible. And the minimizing the risk is keeping in these kind of social isolated pods. So even if, when we do go out into the public, we're able to, to maintain our, our social distance uh, that we've done throughout this whole pandemic. You know, taking the team aspect of your family and then taking that team aspect into the community when you're participating in sports. But you know, we have to keep these groups relatively small to start off with to minimize the risk. Um, we want to make sure that as we're introducing this, that people are, are aware that we don't want to let our guard down and have, uh, um, have opportunities where the virus can potentially spread because we're being nonchalant about the, the different activities that we can do that we've talked about in the past, you know, washing our hands appropriately, wearing masks when appropriate, and, and keeping our safe distance. Um, the, the problem is going to come is when we come back into these different groups and they become more clustered. You know, we're concerned about a lot of different aspects of sport, not just the the, the contact activities, but even just travel, you know, travel from one place to another, whether that's uh, in a bus that needs to be separated or uh, in a car where you may have people that are, are in a more clustered environment, but making sure that you're keeping that cluster in, in a common area. Uh, when we talk about sports being able to spread out, we know that outdoors is gonna be much more safe than indoors. Uh, and if we're able to keep those uh, outdoors activities spread apart, um, then we're going to be much lower risk at, at spreading the virus from, from athlete to athlete. Um, you know, I think that the primary focus is the, the education and, and, and empowering people to be able to do this, but giving the right information to do it as safely as possible. And, and with every injury that we deal with, uh, it's mitigating the risk of returning to sport uh, versus the, the risk and in, in, in potentially of getting another injury. It's no different. You know, we want to make sure that the athletes are as safe as they can be going out there. So they can stay out there as long as they can, and this can be a, a successful venture to keep them out there the entire season. 
All right, good, thank you. We're gonna spend some more time later on in this hour talking about some practical ways to keep practices and games safe, such as small groups and, and other good practices. Dr. Giuliano, we've been talking a little bit about sports. We've been using that, I think, as a uh, proxy for all sorts of activities for youth. How about day camps? When we think about day camps and you know, the summertime typically becomes a, a season where children are involved in that, what would you look for as good practices in order to keep people safe? So day camps should follow a lot of the same guidelines that we've been talking about um, throughout the course of the pandemic, right? So if the, it's a large crowd and lots and lots of kids at that day camp in close proximity, they're going to be at a much higher risk than a smaller cohort um, or potentially a larger group that sets out smaller groups that interact with each other. Um, day camps that are structured around outdoor activities are going to be lower risk than those that are in the indoor area. And day camps, as well as any other activities, the safety also pertains to the age of the child and their ability to follow some of our social distancing recommendations. Right? Young children are more likely to get very excited, a little bit more impulsive, and get too close to one another, whereas older children are more likely to be able to respect some of those boundaries. Um, certainly daycare and uh, day camp sessions uh, could benefit from having um, frequent hand sanitizing breaks for children where they're all told that it's time to wash their hands or use the hand sanitizer. Um, having the hand sanitizer out and e easily accessible to the child whenever they need it would be beneficial. Uh, close observation of kids so that if they are to be observed to cough, sneeze, or touch their face, that they are immediately taken over to one of those hand sanitizing stations. And if there's concern that they're becoming sick, um, that they are taken away from the group immediately um, so that they can be uh, safely transported home and reduce the risk of transmission in those settings. Um, these camps should also look at frequent disinfecting um, with really, really good cleanings at the beginning and the end of the day, but also periodic cleanings of um, equipment or shared toys um, that multiple children could have touched. Um, and then I think one of the last things that the camps should really be looking at is having children um, bring as many of their own supplies as possible, um, especially related to uh, food and beverage. Um, if, if they are not sharing food and beverage, not touching each other's, and we're minimizing the amount of people um, in the camp setting that are touching their food, um, then that will help to decrease the risk as well. Great, thank you. Well, one of the questions that have come through in lots of different forms is around how, how is the virus transmitted and, and what, are, what is safe? So Dr. Schaefer, if you could expand on this. And so questions are coming in around, for example, can we share balls? Can we share equipment? Uh, can we share water jugs? Does the virus uh, transmit through sweat if we happen to bump up against each other and we're both sweating? Comments on that, please. Sure, yeah, so for what we know about the virus, this is more of a um, transmitted through droplets. So those would come through um, any secretions from the nose and mouth. So that's why there's such an emphasis on using the mask in order to prevent that spread to um, other people. Um, but those droplets can uh, live on surfaces and they live on surfaces at different lengths of time depending on um, you know, what type of material it's made out of. So certainly I think it is very important to highlight in sports and in camps um, the frequent cleaning with uh, the CDC approved uh, uh, disinfectants. Uh, specifically with sports, like disinfecting the equipment in between uses is, is important, especially for things where you, I mean, in ball sports where you were literally sharing the ball with each other, um, making sure that um, it's disinfected frequently um, and uh, players are using their, their own equipment as much as possible. So certainly not sharing helmets and pads and all that stuff, which is generally not shared anyway. Um, making sure that athletes each have their own water bottle, um, not even giving the option of having a water jug out there, I think is, is very important. But also emphasizing that this is still the summer. This is, um, athletes still need to be acclimatized to working out and uh, participating in uh, warm weather. So we do need to make sure that water is available and that um, athletes come with their own, with their own water. Um, Thank you. 
Thank you for that. So, uh, Dr. Figler, if you could expand a little bit on what Dr. Schaefer was just sharing, and let's compare and contrast two different sports, if you will. One is indoor gymnastics, and the other is uh, perhaps outdoor soccer. But when you when you look at those, what are the practices you would want to see in place? How do those compare? How are they different? How are they similar? So the the, obviously, the indoor sports, as you mentioned before, are a little bit higher risk than outdoor sports, but it also depends on the number of people that are in that space to start off with, right? So, uh, gymnastics, obviously, you know, a lot of apparatus, um, but there are also wide areas where people get spread out to, so they can keep that six to even 12 feet distance on a regular basis. Um, uh, the, the risk of transmission in that closed environment is smaller because of um, just the area and the volume that's there, and hopefully it's well ventilated as well. Uh, smaller area, smaller gym, you're going to increase the risk, especially with the number of people you're going to have in that smaller area. Uh, the same as the other sporting equipment, you're going to have to clean the apparatus in between individuals to make sure that they're not uh, potentially contracting. Um, we do worry about the high volume of a higher intensity exercise. So say floor and you know the breathing that goes on with that as well. But again, in a wider area over a large area or one individual's there, probably much less risky, um, which is different than obviously soccer. Soccer outdoors, um, you know, for practices, keeping people more spread out would be ideal. Having everyone have their own individual ball to start off with would be ideal. Uh, keeping them in uh, certain groups, so uh, if, if, if these groups of, of players are in one section, they can uh, practice drills with that same group over the course of time. Uh, the bigger issue that we're going to get in is where, where there's jostling of, of athletes in, in the mix when they go back into contact activities, which are, are currently still um, not recommended at this time to see how this first kind of phase goes as we reintroduce sports. Uh, but the contact, the elbowing, the heading, uh, the, the play in the box, so to speak, uh, the goalie, you know, touching all the different balls. These are all concerns that we have. Um, the breathing heavy. So when we talk about somebody just talking, they're spreading the virus. Somebody breathing heavier is going to spread more virus further. Somebody yelling or shouting is going to spread that virus and probably more virus even further if they are infected. Um, the benefits of being outside is that can dissipate a lot faster than if you're in a closed environment. Uh, and obviously, if you're closer to somebody, as we've mentioned before, uh, there's a little bit of a higher risk as well. Uh, so the the sports indoors versus outdoors um, are, are those two sports, gymnastics and, and, and soccer, completely different, right? More individualized sport indoors, probably relatively safe uh, versus soccer outdoors, somewhat individualized during drills, but more contact area, still safe if you can maintain the appropriate distance. Okay, thank you. So let's transition a little bit to uh, some some of the, I'll say the practical, and you're starting to, to get to that. What are the, the practical activities that people can employ as we start to get back to this? And let's start with this first question, which is around face mask use. We talk a lot about how important that is in reducing the spread. So should players wear face masks during practice? Who would like to answer that? So I, you know, we, we've gone back and forth with this uh, and, and there's a lot of recommendations coming up from the Iowa High School Athletic Association and, and actually the governor right now. Um, the, we know based on evidence that face masks decrease the risk of transmission, period. Um, we, we, there's less evidence on face shields for sure. So if, if, it, if the opportunity arises where somebody's at practice listening or going to practice, or going away from practice, or standing on the sidelines, or being spoken to by the coaches, or the coaches speaking to them. If they can wear a mask and it's not medically contraindicated because of asthma or potentially heat or any other issues, they should wear a mask. When any, any opportunity that we have, we should wear a mask because if, we're going, if we are going to reintroduce ourselves into this situation, we want to keep it as safe as possible. And we know that the mask can potentially decrease that risk. Um, it is going to be very challenging to have an athlete who is out there who is uh, increasing their level of intensity of breathing very hard to wear a mask. Um, I don't know if any of you have tried to walk up a, a four flights of stairs in a mask. It is different than not wearing a mask. And so, you know, we have to make sure that the athletes are, again, well acclimated to this, but it's very difficult to wear a mask and, and breathe appropriately. And, and there's fears of, you know, the potential lack of oxygen exchange through some of the masks too, which could lead to you know, higher risk of, of asthma attacks or higher risk of just not getting enough oxygen and, and not feeling as well when they're exercising as well, decreasing their endurance. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, face shields, 
if, if they can't wear a mask, maybe they should be wearing a shield because we do know that the shields probably work as well. Um, there's also the communication with the coaches as well. Uh, you know, the coaches wearing a mask and yelling at the players, not being able to see their mouth moving, so they may not be able to communicate as well. So um, ideally, if they're in a situation where they can wear a mask, they wear the mask. If they can't, they should probably wear a shield for protection. Again, this is about protecting the team and everything that we can do individually to protect the team, to keep the team out there is going to be extremely important. Dr. Giuliano, how would you uh, compare that idea of wearing a, a mask to other types of activities that youth are involved in? Uh, plays, concerts, theater, uh, go back to day camps, those other types of activities. Would you recommend that children wear a face mask in those settings? Yes. So as Dr. Siegler was mentioning, the, the challenge with the mask is when you're really increasing your physical intensity and that potentially posing a risk to an athlete. The examples that you just gave, while there could be situations where they're more intense, like outdoor play at a camp or potentially you know, dancing in a musical, overall their energy expenditure is generally lower. And in those situations, they're also more likely to be in closer proximity to other individuals. Um, you also mentioned some indoor activities. So we've talked also about how that increases your risk. So anytime that we can safely wear a mask, we should have masks on our faces. Dr. Schaefer, recognizing that the majority of the people that are going to be interacting with the children, the coaches, the instructors, the administrators, are not trained medical professionals like yourself, what are the medical issues they should be aware of with these children? So, for example, how is asthma potentially impacted um, or other individual health risks that might be higher that instructors should be more aware of? Sure. So, um, you know, we, we mentioned that this is a respiratory disease um, for, for the most part. And um, so chronic lung conditions such as asthma, such as cystic fibrosis, um, do put those athletes at a personal higher risk of um, leading to kind of flare-ups of their underlying conditions. And certainly we talk about how the mask can make that even a little bit more difficult. So making sure that those athletes, that you have identified those athletes, um, and that those athletes come prepared with the medical equipment they need. Um, and as we were talking about prior to um, going live here, that making sure that athletes bring their own inhalers and that they are not sharing medical supplies with other people and that they all come prepared for the season. So I think that's very important. But also thinking about, and this is where it becomes a family decision about participation in athletics, because there are certainly people um, that maybe the um, student athlete or the athlete is not necessarily at higher risk, but there might be somebody in their family who is. There's somebody who is immunocompromised, who, um, who if they get COVID really would be um, at at a high risk of, of complications. And um, certainly we know that, you know, the, the younger people are getting the disease and can be asymptomatic carriers of it and can bring it home. So I think that has to be part of it too. Um, and um, thinking about that, the other people who are on the field when people are um, playing are our coaches and parents who are higher risk. And I think those people need to be identified as well. Um, certainly when I'm covering football games, I'm also watching the referees because those people are at higher risk of cardiac events. And I think those people are also at higher risk of getting uh, COVID-19. So understanding kind of who you are uh, taking care of on the field. Good advice. Thank you. We, we started to talk uh, about some practical tips for when we start these activities back, out, back up, um, spreading out, bringing your own equipment to practice, keeping in small dedicated groups. In these early stages, are there other practices that organizations should be looking to employ in order to ensure we start as safe as possible? I think it starts at home, you know, and I think that the, the, the purpose of, you know, educational, um, you know, is, the education of this is no different than education about concussions that was really prominent a few years back. You know, we want to make sure, sure people are aware of this, and obviously it's, it's all over the news. We've been dealing with this for several months, but people need to be aware of what they're doing, going outside of the environment and, and doing that symptom checklist before they leave the house. So, um, you know, one of the recent studies uh, was suggested that this, the loss of sense of smell and taste is a very early indicator of some of the disease process. And there are a myriad of symptoms that happen with this and you can't just rely on that, but 
that's something that people need to be aware of, that if a, a child is losing their sense of smell or taste, that, that, that is a sign that they probably shouldn't be stepping outside and exposing their other teammates to it. So looking for all the different uh, symptoms, the fevers, the chills, the cough, et cetera, et cetera, all those are extremely important. Uh, doing a self temperature check before you leave the house as well. You know, the, the question that you have when you do the self temperature check is if it's a little bit elevated, are you putting your teammates at risk? And the question is, is if you leave the house and you expose your teammates, are you a better teammate by staying home and protecting your team because you may be getting sick or going and, and getting to practice and potentially exposing your teammates to what you may have as well? Um, and the other component of that is what Dr. Schaefer mentioned is, is you know, there's other people at home too. And if they're feeling sick, and you may not be feeling sick, and you may be asymptomatic or an asymptomatic spreader, if someone else is feeling sick, you probably shouldn't be going to practice either. So do the check before you get out the door. If it's above 100.4, you shouldn't leave the door. But if it's, if it's any elevation at all and you check your temperature, you should really reconsider whether you're, you're being a good teammate uh, by leaving versus staying home and, and, and monitoring your symptoms before you go back. So I hear you advocating for people doing that symptom and temperature checking at home. Should the administrator of the program be doing that when children arrive to the activity? It's a, it's a great question. And um, I would err on the side of saying yes, because we don't have a lot of uh, objective measurements of, of what we're, we're able to say from a, a testing standpoint, whether somebody uh, has any kind of symptoms with COVID or uh, outward symptoms of COVID-19 that we can specifically see. Temperature is the only thing that we can really monitor on a superficial basis. Um, and that, that questionnaire, even if they were to check it off on a daily basis and the, for the coaches, for the administrators as the athlete comes walking in, that gives them that reinforced education that they should be monitoring these symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis so they, again, won't step outside the door if they have any of those symptoms. Um, if somebody does present, prevent, or present with a slightly elevated temperature, first thing we have to think about a 90 degree heat is environmental. So you sit in a cold environment, you can recheck it. And uh, in, in all honesty, a lot of the temperatures that we're seeing right now um, that are coming in from the outdoors are usually environmental than they are actually illnesses. So rechecking them after sitting in a cold environment for five to 10 minutes and it comes back down to normal, probably safe. But to err on the side of caution is more prudent than anything we can do. Thank you. Dr. Giuliano, uh, one of the questions that's come up as we think about moving forward and we move through different uh, types of activities in different sports, there are some that naturally have more direct contact than others. And, you know, we spend a lot of time using uh, examples of soccer and football today, but there's other examples. For example, uh, dance, where perhaps you have a, a partner or cheer where you're stunting with, uh, with your teammates. Any thoughts on those types of activities and way, when may be a safe and how do we return to a safe way in those environments? Yeah. So similar concepts would apply here. Um, yes, these are close contact, although it's going to be close contact in those examples that you gave, probably with just one other individual in the example of dance. If you have one partner that you're always dancing with, um, and that partner is also following the same good hygiene practices that you are and social distancing, um, you know, outside of the, the dance studio, um, your relative risk is low because you're just in contact with that one person. Uh, cheer would be a little bit different because you're typically talking about expanding the squad sum. Um, although most cheer groups are relatively smaller in comparison to say, you know, the large football team. Right. So the more folks you have, the higher your risk. So cheer is probably a little bit riskier than an individual dance partner. Um, cheer could help to minimize some of that risk with some of the other best practices that we talked about in terms of um, segregating the groups so that maybe you have a cohort that does all of their stunts together and another cohort that does all of their stunts together, both in practices and in performances. Um, you could you know, think about dividing the team up so that you're in um, groups of two, three, or four, and the smaller those groups are, the safer it's going to be. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schaefer, there's uh, a number of questions that are coming in around some of the activities that, uh, that accompany typically the fall time in uh, high school athletics, as an example, and that is uh, marching bands, so marching together, and then in turn, as that starts to transition into winter, typically more indoor types of performances, uh, as well as singing and musicals and those types. So thoughts on how to return to those activities? 
Yeah, I think that the um, the same the same principles I think are are applying that we're kind of hammering home here is the, the starting with um, small individual groups and kind of expanding out, and those are those are the principles behind most of the like resocialization repopulation plans that like the National Federation of High Schools have put out and the NCAA has put out, is that we trial and error a lot of these things. So you know you take a good kind of two week three week period of trying with smaller groups of people keeping really good social distance and then seeing how everybody can comply with those regulations and then adding in you know now you can you know you have a group of 10 people and now you can have a group of you know more people of 25 people and it really does have to be individualized and you just have to um, use a lot of kind of common sense as well as the you know the recommendations that are being put out and figuring out honestly sometimes a lot of creative new ways to do things um, um, you talk about singing groups, and I guess that's something I hadn't really thought about before, but um, certainly staggering people, making sure everybody, you know, is projecting in one way so we're not getting droplets kind of all over the place. Um, um, and and it's, been, it's been kind of fun to see all the creative new ways that people have been able to repopulate everything from, from restaurants and social situations. I think some of those will come along with um, marching band and dance. I mean, just having really widespread performances or having two squads. So. Um, it's going to be a lot of people being creative plus trying to just maintain those general rules. So following up on, on those examples, uh, one of the items that many children hold near and dear are the social aspects that come with participation. There's the actual time where we are participating in the sport, but then there's the social, I get to see my friends, perhaps before, during, and after. Maybe we do stuff together. Maybe even we travel from point A to point B together. What would you recommend in those scenarios, Dr. Figler? So you know, we're, we're talking about you know the congregating again, and and the congregation probably before, during, and after are going to be more problematic than the actual sport itself, because that's when we're going to see people in closer contact again, letting their guard down, potentially pulling their mask off. So. And I, mean, I know we're hammering this home, but you know, wearing a mask in those different environments is going to be important. Um, we've talked about you know locker room accessibility, training room accessibility, and making sure that uh, people are staggering and, and keeping that same social distance they would keep in the grocery store, or a restaurant, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to make sure that they are they are keeping their distance. Um, uh, the there is going to be the innate want to smack hands, to high five, to hug, to do all that stuff. And it's for all of us, it's difficult. Uh, but we wanna make sure that we're, somebody's enforcing that because whether it's a coach or whether it's the other teammates looking out for each other and say, dude, man, you can't do that because it's going to potentially increase your risk. And by increasing that risk, it potentially hurt the team. Um, you know, the, we talked about uh, car rides earlier. You know, you should be riding in the car with your family and that would be ideal if you're just riding in a car. Uh, we're very concerned about potential for bus rides. And if somebody is sick getting on the bus, whether we're on a two hour trip to go someplace for a college uh, event. Uh, could that potentially cause, you know, other athletes to be infected because of this small environment? Uh, we try to, we're gonna, we're putting together plans to try to keep social distancing for that as well. Um, but, but trying to minimize the amount of contact, not just physical contact, but you know, keeping that distance during that time is gonna be extremely important and keeping it out in the open, uh, keeping it more outside than inside, we think is gonna help decrease the risk as well. So uh, a convertible bus, perhaps. A convertible bus would be a great, the double-decker outdoor, you know, <laughs> keep everybody on the top rack would be ideal. Okay. So if we can make that happen, we'll make that happen. So we also have some sports that have some unique environments uh, where participation is on a, in a unique spot. For example, swimming and skiing, right? Those are two very different settings. Uh, thoughts on participation in either of those activities? Dr. Giuliano? Yeah, so those would probably fall into some of our safer categories. Um, so swimming's indoors, yet chlorine is likely to inactivate the virus. Um, so you don't have to worry about athletes breathing directly into the water. It's the time that they are out of the water um, that we need to make sure that we are keeping them distanced. So certainly a large team in a small pool would present a lot more challenges um, than perhaps a smaller team in a larger facility. Um, but even if you're working with a large team, you can think about staggering practice times, 
um, or you know, certain groups come on Monday and another group comes on Tuesday and you, you know, alternate your, your land activities and cardiovascular training and, and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of creativity that you could get around with swimming um, and the very rare situation that you wouldn't be able to maintain six feet of social distancing. Um, and skiing is an individual sport and it is outdoors. Um, so really that one sounds you know, great in terms of all of the activities that we've talked about um, today and incredibly low risk. Thank you. Uh, let's spend a little bit of time talking about those people that work with our children, referees, coaches, instructors. How do they keep themselves safe? Dr. Schaefer, earlier you mentioned that they may be a group that's at uh, higher risk for complications. So how do we keep them safe? Absolutely, I think that they need to be very stringent about following um, all the guidelines and rules. I think that they need to be masked pretty much at all times. Um, I think they need to be the ones that are the leaders setting the example for the, for the athletes participating. Um, I, you know, Though yelling and cheering is a big part of sport, you can certainly do that through a mask without probably any cardiovascular risk. So I like I strongly encourage them to do that. Um, I also like what um, Dr. Fidler mentioned earlier about sideline management and making sure that you are kind of identifying people on your staff or on the team who are going to be in charge of helping enforce those rules as well. Um, uh, making sure that, you know, especially like I, I'm thinking about a football sideline or a soccer sideline, how the, everyone kind of piles on top of each other and they move with the game around each other, trying to keep the social, the social distance there, trying to make sure that they're wearing their masks, they're keeping track of their own water bottles. Um, so I, I think that um, the coaches and the, the adults in the situation really have to be the, the models for behavior. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's use that as an opportunity to dovetail to spectators. Uh, should we allow spectators at events? Should we symptom check? Uh, should we require masks? Thoughts on spectators for these various events? So it's a, it's a great question. And the, the answer to that is if it's safe, then, then yes. And, and uh, again, you know, outdoor uh, spectators are gonna be a little bit easier than indoor spectators. Um, it's going to be hard to have temperature checks, but I think if somebody is over 100.4 and they come into the stadium, they probably shouldn't be allowed into the stadium to, to decrease the risk of transmission. Um, we've talked about the, the social distancing and, and sitting in certain environments. You know, one of the, one of the things that we, we don't need to do is separate families when they come into that environment. If they've been living with each other, they can probably sit with each other safely in the stand. It kind of makes common sense. Um, but uh, having those different areas cordoned off and having the appropriate social distance and not having too many people behind you where they could shout, yell, scream, and then potentially uh, transmit the virus through the respiratory droplets that we mentioned before, uh, because that can, you know, in essence, spew the virus all over the place. Um, which is what we're trying to decrease. We're trying to decrease our risk of, of transmission. Um, that would also be decreased by wearing masks. And if, an, if somebody can be sitting in the stands with wearing a mask, that is going to decrease the risk of transmission to other people around them and potentially protect themselves as well. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of them wearing uh, masks. I think we all are uh, in the stands. Um, and that leads into the congregation afterwards as well that we were talking about before. You know, not having them wait outside to, you know, to wait for the players to come out of the locker room, you know, keeping their social distance after the game to make sure that they're not all, you know, separated this whole time and then should come together with the potential, potential to spread more virus. So um, I, I do think that there, there are definitely reasons for us to limit the number of people that are in the stands or in the stadiums. And I think that comes from a, a, a site by site area. You know, obviously standing on a soccer field you know, there can be parents every, you know, five, six, or six to 12 feet or so, you know, all the way around the soccer field. That should not be very difficult to manage from that perspective. Um, when we talk about starting sports indoors, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And that's, again, going to be every uh, individual stadium, every individual arena, uh, and how many people can actually fit in there safely. Let's spend a few minutes talking about uh, what happens when a participant has symptoms, uh, testing, and return to, to play and what it means for their teammates. So first, let's start at the beginning of that. Uh, what do we do when someone has symptoms and what's the process to return them to play and what's the process for their 
uh, teammates that they've been interacting with. Dr. Juliana? So anybody with symptoms should isolate themselves from their team members and anybody else in the vicinity immediately. As soon as you're feeling unwell, you need to take that ownership. Um, and if the athlete hasn't been able to identify that themselves or um, take that ownership, then that's the responsibility of the adults involved in the sports to really get them out as quickly as possible. Um, our guidelines for returning to school, returning to sports, returning to work would be that you need to have had at least 10 days pass from the onset of your symptoms. You need to be showing that your symptoms are gone or considerably better. So if you had a significant cough at the beginning with a minimal lingering cough at 10 days, you're probably not Trans, not able to transmit the virus, and so that would be considered improvement. And you need to have been fever free for at least three days without the use of fever lowering medications like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, Tylenol. Um, and once you've met all of those criteria, you can um, come back, assuming that you have the energy um, and the lung capacity to be able to do so. How do you, uh, I'm in anticipating my own children saying, I feel better, it was just a one day thing, I want to go back. How do you manage that? Um, so that's going to be the case for a lot of our children, right? We know that most kids who experience um, COVID-19 infections generally have more mild symptoms. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not exposing others to that same problem. Right, so it's great that they're starting to feel better. And if they are feeling better and worried about losing endurance and wanting to be able to keep up, they should practice it as an individual at home um, and really respect the health of their team members and wait that full 10 days. It does not do them and their team any service to go back and start infecting everybody so that next week the whole team can't participate in the tournament. Great. Good answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Schaefer, how would, you, how would you say this then in turn applies to teammates? So if I was uh, practicing with someone who came down with symptoms yesterday, uh, what does that mean for me? Should I also stay home? Sure. That's, that's, a, that's another kind of tough question. So um, in, an, in an ideal world, if you had someone who came down with symptoms and then was able to um, in, in qualified to get that COVID-19 testing, um, you, I think we'd have a, a pretty cut and dry answer. So if they tested positive for COVID-19 and then now we have a, positive, a known positive on that team, um, I, I do think it is important that everybody um, on the team now has to honestly self-isolate for about 14 days. And um, However, you know, a lot of times where you're, you're going to get those symptoms, it's the next day, we don't have a test result back, and that becomes where, that's where it becomes a little bit harder. Um, I do think it's important, though, we have to take this seriously. And so I think I like um, what Dr. Giuliano said about taking ownership for it and informing your teammates. And then I think that the team would have to um, isolate, to be honest. I don't know if, Rick, if you have any other kind of opinions on that so it, it, it's a rough question because you know again you know we're not going to know you know and, and if we know that it's a positive test then it makes our job a lot easier and even if it is a positive test the question that we have is how long have they been positive is it residual symptoms and their end of the 14 days and and this is where it comes to that constant monitoring in an ideal world we would know everybody's antibodies and, and whether or not they were infected and whether or not they were immune to getting it reinfected um, we're not going to have that, and, and that's the reality. We're not going to be able to test people on a regular basis, a rolling basis, to say, yes, you are positive or not positive. And this is where it comes down to some of the, you know, the hypervigilance that we're preaching right now. And, and that goes with all different communicable diseases, whether it's mono on a college campus or whether it's strep throat in a classroom. You know, we're trying to make sure that people are staying as healthy as they can for as long as they can. This obviously poses a different risk because of what we mentioned before about the possibility of transmitting to somebody at home that may be at a higher risk. We know that kids have milder symptoms. We know that the risk of kids having catastrophic problems is not nearly as high as their parents or grandparents or coaches, referees, et cetera, et cetera. But to err again on the side of caution is going to be very important. Um, we're gonna have to take every case individually. And, and you know, we kind of alluded to this, but everybody that comes in with a cold is not COVID-19. 
But in this era, everyone that comes in with cold symptoms is going to be suspected as having COVID-19 until proven otherwise. And once the testing becomes more ubiquitous, once the testing becomes more available to everybody, cheaper, and we're able to find out those positive tests earlier on, what we have is what we have now, which is monitor your symptoms, protect yourself, and if in doubt, sit them out. Bring them out and, and you know, rest accordingly as, far, as long as they, they possibly can. Um, whether it's 10 days, whether it's 14 days, we don't know the right answer to that. We, we really don't. And we're not gonna know the onset of infection versus the potential you know, diminished risk significantly to the point where they're not at, at any risk to anybody. I love the fact that Dr. Juliana was saying, you need to exercise once you start to feel better because that acclimation period is extremely important. Um, this also leads into a potential further discussion about what's the risk of the athlete returning to play, whether it's asthma or whether it's the unknown. You know, there are the American Academy of Cardiology, the American Heart Association is putting out guidelines for testing after this for high level athletes. You know, how much is that gonna trickle down into our, our, our high school and our youth athletes? We don't know yet, but there are tests that are going on at the International Olympic Committee uh, um, and the US Olympic Committee where they're testing athletes that are positive to see if there's any cardiac abnormalities because we don't know, similar to other virus, whether there's gonna be myocarditis and a potential risk. But if you are not able to get back to that level of activity from a cardiovascular fitness level that you were before you were a little bit sick, that's definitely something that's gonna warrant further investigation by your pediatrician or sports medicine specialist or family medicine physician. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a very, very hard question to answer and I'm glad that you gave it to Marie first. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll give you the follow-up uh, more direct question. Uh, in lieu of not having necessarily the ability to confirm whether or not someone has COVID-19, if someone is suspected of it, let's say at a day camp, should we close a day camp? Um, this goes back to the contact tracing, right? And this is one of the reasons why we're talking about these little pods of groups and these, you know, the, the smaller groups, because the more that you're interacting with that person, the higher risk they are, you have a transmitting. No different than what we did early on in the pandemic where we all stayed inside, inside in, in our houses. And studies show that if you're in your house and you're wearing a mask and somebody's infected, you're less likely to get that, right? So if we take the, that small group and we can identify that small group, maybe it's just that group needs to get shut down and as opposed to the entire camp. And that's where it becomes important for, again, the social distancing, the wearing the mask, washing the hands, but we need to make sure that those rules are enforced. So if you take, you know, uh, Joey and then put them in group A and then Joey goes to group B and then go, Joey goes to group C, group A, B, and C may need to be out because he's basically interacting with them if he tested positive. So I, I think that the, the more that we can control those little groups of people, it's no different than how we managed our families during this time as well. Uh, the risk is always going to be there to, to go step outside your group and be exposed to other people. And as we continue to increase socialization, we're going to continue to increase the risk of infection. We, we know that. Um, and, and again, staying as safe as possible is going to be important. Um, uh, and, and it's going to be something that we need to watch, right? Because for those day camps, for those, those sporting groups, uh, we don't know how, spread, how fast that is going to spread. But once we start to see the information, you know, there was a uh, Louisiana State, LSU um, had some players that were tested positive initially, and then a lot more player, players tested positively a week or two into their volunteer training camp because they were frequenting the bars, and that's where the outbreak was. So you can only control what you can control. So we can control the sidelines. We can do everything we can in an athletic training room. We control the practices, but you're still responsible for going outside and potentially bringing something in. If, and so once you step outside those, the, you know, the, that field, that court, you got to make sure that you're doing the right thing for your team. So part of what I'm hearing you describe is the, uh, the adults that are structuring these activities, if they structure them in a way where they're able to keep small groups, they're more likely to be able to keep those other groups up and running and active if, if uh, sickness was to hit a single group. That's the hope. Yeah, that's the hope. Great. Good. That's good advice. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's get a little bit more specific around... Uh, the, the specific balls, baseballs, volleyballs, basketballs, footballs, all these things that are shared between people. Initially, uh, we, we described it's best if someone has their own ball. It's, 
it's hard to play baseball with your own ball, right? As, as an example, it doesn't work, work so well. Uh, there are some other activities within basketball, for example, you can use your own ball. Should we be cleaning those balls uh, between each player? Should we be changing the balls out? And uh, more specifically, practically, how do you how do you do that in a world of basketball where it is uh, once we start to really play the game and we're going beyond skills? Uh, how do you how do you do that? So I would say anytime there's a pause in the activity, you know whether it's a timeout or you know, um, whatever that may be, that's an opportunity for a ball change out um, or a sanitation wipe down. Um, so you know in the context of play, thinking about that. Um, the basketball example that you gave, um, that's probably gonna touch a lot of different hands and get a lot of different droplets on it um, throughout the, the time that we're in, in between and actually playing. Um, so the other important thing in that situation is not just sanitizing the balls, but making sure that the players are sanitizing their hands. Um, because that will, if they're touching their hands and then they later touch their face, that's where their infection risk is going to be higher. So a follow-up question for that. If I just touch the ball but never touch my face, do I get COVID or would I be okay? Not as likely, um, but more than likely at some point you're going to touch your face or you're going to touch something that touches mm -hmm. your face, right? So um, washing your hands, you know, at, at timeouts, having some hand sanitizer available would definitely be helpful. In so frequent hand washing is a key in those types of, uh, or frequent ball cleaning is a key in those types of activities. Yes, yes. And part of that is changing their, their, the culture as well. You know, you have the the guys that lick their fingers, lick their palms, and you know, to get a better grip on the ball. Um, you have people that are coughing into their hands, not their elbow or not a tissue, you know. So, you know, it, it's it's watching them during this course as well. You know, the 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 quarterback that licks his hands eight times before he goes up to under the center, you know, that's gonna be a good a concern. Um, but you can't have him lick his hands and then wash his hands before he gets the ball. Again. <laughs> so you know, keeping something moist on them so they could potentially relearn their behaviors that have been probably ingrained in them for quite a while. Um, you know, we're talking about the, the basketball and sharing the basketball, you know, those balls get sweaty, you know, hands get sweaty and you're passing it. And, uh, you know, the, we, we don't think that sweat necessarily contains an infectious variant of, or amount of the virus, you know, the, may, the virus may be in there, but we don't think that it's infectious, but I don't think that there's any studies that show that sweat is something that's gonna be communicated from, you know, the person to the ball to the other player, it's definitely gonna be more hand mouth contact to the ball and then you know, potentially spreading it that way. Thank you. So uh, as we near the conclusion of our, our time, a couple other uh, questions for you. One is a big, going back to our big picture a little bit, how do we balance these ideas that seem contradictory? So for example, as uh, children head back to school, it's, it's probably, likely that they all won't be in the cafeteria at the same time eating lunch. And yet we're looking to enable and allow contact sports. How do we hold both of those things and, and say that, you know, that's okay and that we're not contradicting ourselves? So I would look at that as one set of universal precautions for everyone that errs on the side of safety, right? So in the cafeteria, we're, we're staggering, we're distanced, and that is what we need to do to keep all of our children safe. For those children and their families who are willing to accept some level of risk because their child is healthy and their family is healthy, they can start to venture into some of these other more uh, risky types of situations um, that, again, as we've talked about before, hopefully have some of the benefits um, for their physical and mental well-being that outweigh um, the risk that they're taking. But those risks aren't going to be acceptable for all children and all families. And so that's why in our general settings, we have to be much more conservative and then let those folks who are, um, think that their family is lower risk be able to make some individual choices around that. For so many um, children and young adults, sports are such a big part of their life and such an important part to their well-being. And they've had such a dramatic change and honestly, a, a very stressful time from, the, from being in a global pandemic at such a young age. And I, I think that it is important to, to try to do this as safely as possible. Any sense of normalcy in their life is really good for their 
their social well-being, their mental well-being. Um, and I agree, it is an informed decision that needs to be made between the family, the parents, the student athletes. And um, I do think that there is a lot of benefit to um, sport in general. And um, with the right information, I think people can make a good decision. So we, we've also been talking a lot about structured activities, right? These, these various activities we've been describing are very structured, uh, organized. What about unstructured activities that children become involved in? Can they go to the playground? Can they have pop-up play dates? What about those types of activities? That's hard because I think a lot of the unstructured activities a lot of them revolve around some of the younger children. And those children, as we talked about before, have a harder time with the social distancing. And I think that that's gonna involve just a lot of parental oversight and uh, caregiver oversight um, about uh, making those situations as clean as possible. Certainly like, well, I have my, my three-year-old, well, I feel safe with my three-year-old going on a swing in the playground. Probably if, you know, if I could wipe it off and be there with him and make sure he's not like licking the swing, <laughs> then I think that's reasonable. But, um, you know, in large group settings and group play, I think that's a little bit harder. I also think it's a little bit harder with the adolescents because they um, are very opinionated and are going to do what they're going to do. So I think that's where a lot of um, the adults need to step in and um, kind of work on behavioral choices. So as we think towards the fall, obviously we're entering summer or in the middle of summer now, as, but as we think towards the fall, are there any changes that we're anticipating? Do you, how, how might the, whether it be the season um, and what's going on weather-wise or whether it be a respiratory and flu season, how might that affect all of this? You know, I, I think we're, we're all very concerned about the numbers that we're seeing across the country and you know, the, the slight uptick in some of the cases across the country and more pe younger people being infected. Um, our, I think our biggest concern is seeing these kind of these two waves hit each other at the same time with flu and with, uh, with COVID-19. Um, that we know we have testing for flu, we know we have treatment for, for flu. We don't have as much testing for COVID-19 and we really don't have a lot of treatments other than symptomatic care for COVID-19 at this point, unless you're in the hospital. Um, we need everyone to get their flu shot. And, you know, that's, that's a, we can't just say, okay, well, it's only COVID-19 because we don't know when that flu is going to come. We don't know how much of it's going to come. The hope is, is that everything that we're doing with this, with all our social distancing, with the mask wearing, et cetera, et cetera, can potentially re the amount of flu that we see across the season as well, but that doesn't mean that that everybody shouldn't get their flu shot as mandated or, or recommended by by their healthcare provider. Uh, it's a very important step to try to, to squelch a lot of what we might see, which is both of these things running the same uh, gamut at the same time. Uh, last question for this afternoon, and, and that is a little bit more of a personal one. What would you look for for your, have your child participate? What are the things you would wanna see a program do? I think the biggest thing I'd be looking for is that culture piece that we've talked about and that level of accountability. Right? If we're setting out expectations for our children um, that they are going to comply to the standards of hand hygiene, of using their own water bottle, of maintaining that six feet of distancing and limiting the number of interactions that they have, then our children are gonna see that that's the way this needs to be. And they're much more likely to comply both on and off the field. Um, and so that accountability piece, I think is the biggest thing I would be looking for. Dr. Schaefer? Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking for the structure. I'm looking for a plan. I'm looking for um, a group that um, has thought about this, is taking it seriously because it is serious and um, that is willing to, to follow what they, what they have put down on paper. And I think that that's what makes me comfortable. And I'm also looking for um, groups that are going to be flexible, that are going to say, okay, if we do have a, a, a student athlete or an athlete that tests positive for COVID-19, that they are serious about shutting that team down for 14 weeks, knowing that they might miss the biggest game of the season, that this athletic season is not going to look like all other athletic seasons and that they are okay with that because that is how it is going to be safe to participate. Dr. Figgins? So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll echo that. And, you know, I think there, there needs to be leading by example. You know, the, the team leaders, the coaches, you know, setting that example of wearing the mask and, and not becoming complacent over the course of time where because they were successful for the first couple of weeks or so, now we can get back to everything that was normal before. 
these guidelines are going to change. And the only way that they are going to be utilized successfully to keep people playing the sports that they love is to make sure that it is not just a guideline list that's there for two or three weeks. It is filed throughout the course of the entire season, because if we don't do that, we're, we're going to run into trouble. Um, you know, we talk about the three W's and, and, and to reiterate again, you know, you know, you wash your hands, uh, you wear a mask and you watch your distance and those three W's that everyone needs to do on a regular basis. Um, I heard a great analogy at one point um, about uh, uh, somebody uh, wearing perfume and if you could smell their perfume or their cologne, you're probably way too close to them. And uh, in our athlete situation and having been around a lot of athletes over the course of my career, if you can smell their body odor, then you are probably way too close to them. The only body odor that you should be smelling is, is your own. So if, if we keep that distance and we keep that throughout the course of the year, we should be a lot more successful than if we're, you know, if we're throwing caution to the wind and saying, listen, you know, we're doing okay with this. We really haven't seen too many cases. You know, we, it, and it's very interesting when we talk about all this stuff because the guidelines that were put out beforehand were to see a downward curve, a significant downward curve, and then we can get back to our socialization. And here we are talking about getting back into sports where there is really not a downward curve in this. And so it, it's even more important to be hyper vigilant about decreasing the, the amount of spread of infection. And this should probably shape us for the rest of our lives, right? So knowing that we can keep a, a distance from each other and, and prevent the spread of infections that otherwise may have taken a team down. You know, we've seen flu take down teams, we've seen MERS infections take down teams, but we're, we're, we're getting that background of information, education out to people that can make sports safer in essence. Yeah, I appreciate what you all shared today. My personal takeaway is that each uh, participant really needs to follow the recommendations that you outlined so that they can keep participating. And, and that's, a, I think, a really important message for our administrators, our coaches, and our youth is that this, these methods are critical to us being able to continue this going forward. Thank you for your time today. I'm sorry we're out of questions. We will look to update our frequently asked questions. Thank you for all of you who submitted questions, and thank you to the three of you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.